In the EE210 lectures, we tend to jump back and forth between learning about different types of circuit devices, such as op amps, capacitors, inductors, potentiometers, resistors, etc., and then learning about different types of analysis techniques. We just finished talking about a new circuit element, the operational amplifier, so now we're going to switch gears and talk about a whole bunch of additional analysis techniques. Specifically, we're going to be talking about three different techniques that are very related. This is covered in our book in Chapter 4, Sections 410 to 413. So you want to read in our book, Sections 410 to 413. We're going to start by talking about linearity. Linearity is a very basic circuit property that these other two properties, superposition and evidence theorem, build on. After linearity, we'll segue into superposition, and we'll do this in the first couple lectures. Then we're going to be spending most of these lectures in this packet dealing with Thevenin's theorem. There are four different techniques we're going to be using for Thevenin's theorem. One's called the equivalent resistance method. Then there's the VOC-ISC method. There's the external stimulation method. And finally, the source transformation method. After we talk about Thevenin's theorem, we're going to briefly talk about Norton's theorem, which is just an extension of Thevenin's theorem. So we're not going to spend much time on that at all. We will then see how Thevenin's theorem and likewise Norton's theorem can be applied to operational amplifier circuits. Finally, we're going to look at two applications of Thevenin's theorem. One is maximum power transfer. We're going to see how you can set a load to get maximum power transferred from a source to a load. And finally, we're going to see how you can model non-ideal measurement devices, voltmeters and ammeters, using Thevenin's theorem. So like I said, these three properties that we're going to focus on in this packet of notes, linearity, superposition, and Thevenin's and Norton's theorem are all related. So let's briefly discuss what these are, and then we'll look at them in more detail after that. So linearity basically is a circuit property that allows us to express any voltage or current in the circuit as a combination of weighted inputs. For example, we might say that the output voltage in a circuit, V out, is going to be some constant A1 times V1 of T plus A2 times V2 of T plus B1 times I1 of T plus B2 times I2 of T. This V out is what we call our output of our circuit. And then our V1, V2, I1, and I2 are what we call our inputs to the circuit. Superposition is related to linearity. It's an analysis technique that allows us to take a complicated circuit and break it down into multiple simpler circuits. So for example, suppose you have a circuit here, which I'm just going to draw as a black box, technically a blue box. And let's say there are two different inputs. Let's say there's a voltage source here, V1, and another voltage source, V2. And let's say we're measuring the output, some voltage at the output, Call it V out. What superposition tells us is we can break this down into two simpler circuits. The first circuit has only V1 activated, and V2 is replaced by a short circuit. And so this output would be called V out sub 1. And then at the same time, we take the same circuit. And now we turn V1 off, and we activate only V2 and measure the output. We'll call that V out sub 2. Turns out that the total output V out is simply the sum of V out 1 plus V out 2. So we will look at this in detail in a few slides. Finally, Thevenin's theorem and Norton's theorem allow us to take an arbitrary complex circuit and break it down to a much simpler model that's consisting of one independent source and one resistor. Thevenin's theorem is one of the hardest theorems to grasp in circuit analysis, but once you understand it, it actually is fairly simple to use. Let's begin now by talking about linearity. Definition of linearity for a circuit is as follows. An electrical circuit is linear if any voltage or current in the circuit can be written in terms of a linear combination of the independent sources. Some key words here, any voltage or current in the circuit. In other words, for a circuit to be linear, this property we're going to be talking about has to be true for any voltage or current in the circuit. And these voltages or currents that we're measuring are what we're going to be calling the outputs of the circuit. 
and it has to be able to be written in terms of a linear combination of the independent sources. So another key term here is the independent sources. The inputs to our circuit are going to be the independent sources. There may be some dependent sources in the circuit as well, but they are not considered inputs to the circuit. So what exactly do we mean by this linear combination? Look at this figure on the right. All these things on the left we're going to be calling our inputs. So you have a whole bunch of voltage sources. We're going to label them VS1, VS2, VS3, all the way down to VS and sub V. So there could be two, three, four, however many independent voltage sources. Likewise, there could be some independent current sources. We're going to label them IS1, IS2, IS3, all the way down to I sub S and I. Those are all going to be our inputs. Our outputs could be any voltage or any current in the circuit. So for example, IO1, VO2 would be two such outputs. So linearity says that any output, for example, VO2, can be written as a linear combination of these inputs, all the different voltage sources, each one multiplied by some value A1, A2, etc. And all of our current sources, IS1, IS2, all the way down to the last one, each one multiplied by another constant, B1, B2, all the way up to this last B. These A's and B's are what we call system parameters, and they basically describe the circuit. The number of system parameters equals the number of independent sources. For example, if you have two independent voltage sources and three independent current sources in a circuit, you will have five system parameters. One important feature of linearity is once you know these system parameters, you can find the output voltage or current for any input in the circuit. And we're going to see this in an example in a few pages. Another important thing with linearity is it allows us to decouple the contributions due to each of these individual inputs. This basically is what superposition is. So as I mentioned, superposition follows directly from linearity. For a circuit to be linear, all of the circuit elements must be linear elements. So which elements are linear elements? Well, fortunately, the vast majority of the circuit elements that we're going to be using in EE210 are linear elements. So in EE210, virtually every circuit we're going to be using is going to be a linear circuit. So linear circuit elements, resistors are linear, capacitors are linear, inductors are linear. The dependent sources we've looked at before, the voltage controlled voltage source, the current controlled voltage source, the voltage controlled current source, and the current controlled current source are all linear elements, provided that they're of these forms here. Operational amplifiers are linear if they're operating in the linear region. Remember, we've looked at op amps operating in the linear region, and then we briefly looked at op amps operating in saturation. For example, when we looked at a comparator. When op amps are in the linear region, they are also linear elements. Semiconductor elements such as transistors and diodes are generally not linear. However, you will see in EE310, not in this course, that some transistor circuits using something called small signal analysis can be treated as linear circuits as well. So elements that are not linear, for the most part, are things that we are not going to look at in EE210. The diode, which we just used briefly in this course, is a nonlinear element. Op amps operating in saturation are nonlinear elements. Some transistor circuits are nonlinear elements. Once again, some are going to be linear, some are going to be nonlinear. Finally, some dependent sources could be nonlinear. For example, if you had a voltage controlled voltage source whose value was 5 times Vx squared, this would be a nonlinear circuit element. Fortunately, as I said before, in EE210, the vast, vast, vast majority of the circuit elements that we deal with are linear, so the vast majority of the circuits that we face in EE210 are linear circuits. I think the best way to understand linearity is just through a couple examples. So let's start with this very simple circuit here. So here we have a circuit with two different independent inputs. We have a current source as an input, and we have a voltage source as an input. And let's say we're interested in two different measurements. Suppose we're interested in the voltage across the 120 ohm resistor, so that would be one output. And let's say we're interested in the current through the 60 ohm resistor, that would be another output. 
So in this particular circuit, we can think of it as two inputs, IS1 and VS1, and two outputs, IA and VB. What we want to do is we now want to express both VB and IA in terms of IS1 and VS1. And we're going to use techniques that we've studied before. Let's find an expression for VB first. We're going to use nodal analysis. Let's put ground down here. So the voltage at this node now is VB. This other node over here, we know the voltage of, it's VS1. Using nodal analysis, we do KCL at the VB node. So that current plus that current plus that current has to equal zero. The current to the left is what? It's negative IS1. Current going down is what? It's VB over 120 ohms, Ohm's law. Current going to the right, once again from Ohm's law, is the voltage at the coming from point minus the voltage at the going to point divided by the resistance. So the current through the 60 ohm resistor is VB minus VS1 over 60 ohms. The sum of those three currents has to be zero. So we can combine terms VB times 1 over 120 plus 1 over 60 is equal to what? IS1 plus VS1 over 60. Get a common denominator here. VB times 1 plus 2 over 120 is IS1 plus VS1 over 60. This is 3 over 120 or 1 over 40. So we get that VB is equal to 40 times IS1 plus VS1 over 60. Finally, we can rewrite this as VB is equal to 2 thirds times VS1 plus 40 times IS1. This is now the linear form of the output. We're saying our output, VB, is equal to, to some constant A1 times VS1 plus B1 times IS1. So this 2 third and this 40 are our system parameters that we talked about a couple pages ago. And what we see is that our output is a linear combination of our two inputs, our VS1 and our IS1. We can do this type of process for any voltage or current in the circuit. For example, if our output is IA, we can find an expression for it in terms of VS1 and IS1. We're going to use mesh analysis to do this. So let's define our two meshes. This left mesh, we know the current because we have this external branch current source. So the, this mesh current is IS1. It's known. This mesh current is unknown. We'll give it a variable. Since we already have that variable IA, we'll call this mesh current IA. So we don't need to do a KVL equation for the left mesh. We only need to do it for the right mesh. So we'll start down here. We'll sum of voltage drop plus voltage drop plus voltage drop equals zero and see what we get. So the voltage drop through the 120 ohm resistor is the resistance times the current in the direction we're going. We're going in the direction of IA. We're going opposite direction of IS1. So it's 120 times IA minus IS1. Then we go through a 60 ohm resistor. So it's 60 times IA. Then we go through a voltage source. We hit the plus terminal first. So it's plus VS1 is equal to zero. Let's factor out IA. We get IA times 120 plus 60. On the other side of the equation, we get negative VS1 plus 120 times IS1. Dividing both sides by 180, we get IA is equal to minus 1 over 180 times VS1 plus 120 over 180 or 2 thirds times IS1. So just like with VB, we can express IA as a linear combination of our two inputs. So as before, our inputs our IS1 and VS1, and our output in this case is IA. Our system parameters are minus 1 over 180 and 2 thirds. And we get our general expression. Our output is going to be some constant times the first input plus some constant times the second input.
regardless of how complex this circuit would be, regardless of the number of independent sources, regardless of how many outputs we're measuring, we could do something like this to express every output as a linear combination of the different inputs. And that's basically all there is to linearity. But how is this useful? Well, it's useful in a couple different ways, as we'll show in examples on the next few pages. This is the same circuit, but now we have a specific value for IS1 and a specific value for VS1, and we're asked to find what IA and VB are for that. We don't need to start from scratch, though, to solve that, because from the previous page, we know what? We know that the voltage VB is 2 thirds times VS1 plus 40 times IS1. That was this first equation here. We also know from the previous page that IA is minus 1 over 180 times VS1 plus 2 thirds times IS1. So we can now plug in values for IS1 and VS1 and directly get IA and VB. So VB is just 2 thirds times 90 volts plus 40 times 3 amps. That'd be 60 plus 120. 180 volts. Likewise, IA would be what? It would be negative 1 over 180 times 90 volts plus 2 thirds times 3 amps. We get negative 1 half plus 2 or 1.5 amps. You may ask yourself, well, why would you go through and do this general expression on this page and then just plug these in? Wouldn't it be easier just to put IS1 equals 3 amps and VS1 equals 90 volts and solve for them directly. Yes, that would be easier, except what if you wanted to do this not just for those? Suppose you also wanted to calculate the following. Suppose IS1 was 4 amps and VS1 was 60 volts, and you wanted to calculate the output. Suppose you wanted to do it again for IS1 of 6 amps and VS1 of minus 20 volts and you wanted to calculate the output. Suppose you wanted to do it for an input of minus 2 amps and minus 10 volts, and you wanted to calculate the output. It's pretty clear here, if you want to do it for just a single set of input values, 3 amps and 90 volts, it might make sense to just calculate it directly. But if you want to do it for a whole bunch of values here, it makes more sense to come up with a general expression and then you can just plug those values into the general expressions to give the voltages and the currents you need. That's where linearity is useful. Another place where linearity is useful is in solving circuits backwards using the linearity principle. I should point out that this process works only when you have a single input, either one independent voltage source or one independent current source. If you have more than one independent source, this method does not work. The idea behind solving the circuits backwards is based upon the fact that your output, whatever voltage or current you're measuring, can be written as some constant A1 times your input. So the solution technique is as follows. Rather than solving it the normal way, in solving the circuit backwards, we're going to assume an output value that's convenient, usually one volt or one amp, depending upon whether we're measuring a voltage or a current. And then we work backwards to see what input would give us that output. We use that to solve for our A1. Once we know A1, you plug in the true value of your input and use the value of A1 you just solved for to get the true value of the output. If this seems a little confusing, I think the example on the next page will clarify it. This is the circuit you might recognize from before. It is a ladder network. When we solved the circuit earlier, how did we solve it? We basically did a whole bunch of resistor combinations to reduce this into a single loop circuit, and we found the voltage at this point. And then we expanded it one more step to find the voltage at this point using voltage division, and then we expanded it again to find the voltage at this point and solve the circuit. If you look back in the notes on voltage division, we did this example that way. We could also solve this using nodal or mesh analysis. Using nodal analysis, you could create a voltage variable there, 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 and solve three equations and three unknowns to get Vx. Using mesh analysis, we could have created a mesh current there, a mesh current there, a mesh current there. Once you solve for the third mesh current, you could then use 
Ohm's law to get Vx. But we're going to solve this a different way now. We're going to use this linearity principle. What we're going to do is we're going to assume a value for Vx, and then we're going to work back to see what value of Vn would give us that given Vx. From there, we'll determine our variable A, because remember, what we know is that Vx is going to be some constant A times Vn. Once we know A, we can then plug in 64 volts to get the true value for Vx. So let's assume a convenient value for Vx. We're going to assume 1 volt. What we want to do is determine what input would give us 1 volt at the output. And from that, we're going to be able to find our A. So Vx is 1 volt. This current here, we'll call it I1 from Ohm's law. I1 would have to be 1 volt divided by 3 ohms, or one third of an amp. We can then use Ohm's law because we know the voltage across the 9 and 3 ohm resistor in combination would be what? I1 times 12 ohms. So this voltage here, let's call this point here ground, so this voltage here, let's call that V1, would be 9 plus 3 times I1, or 12 times 1 third, or 4 volts. If V1 was 4 volts, then this current, which I will call I2, from Ohm's law would be what? I2 would have to be V1 over 4 ohms or 1 amp. What would that give us? That would give us this current here, let's call it I3, would be I1 plus I2. That basically comes from a KCL there. Negative I3 plus I2 plus I1 is equal to 0. So I3 would be I1 plus I2, which would be 1 third of an amp plus 1 amp, so this is 4 thirds of an amp. If I3 was 4 thirds of an amp, what would this voltage here be? We'll call that V2. V2 would then be V1 plus whatever voltage drop we had across this 3 ohm resistor. So V2 would then be 3 ohms times the current through the 3 ohm resistor plus V1 or 3 times 4 thirds of an amp plus V1, which is 4 volts, or 8 volts. So V2 would have to be 8 volts. This variable, let's call it I4, would have to be what then? I4 from Ohm's law would have to be 8 volts over 6 ohms, or 4 thirds of an amp. This current I5 then, once again, from KCL, would have to be I4 plus I3. So I5 would have to be I4 plus I3, or 4 thirds of an amp plus 4 thirds of an amp, which is 8 thirds of an amp. Finally, we can use Ohm's law again to see that Vn, which is this voltage here, would have to be V2 plus whatever voltage drop we had across that 3 ohm resistor there. So Vn would have to be the voltage drop across that leftmost 3 ohm resistor, which is 3 times I5, plus the voltage at the V2 node. So we get 3 times 8 thirds, that's 8, plus V2 was 8, we get 16 volts. So what this is telling us is that if we had a 16 volt input, it would give us a 1 volt output. And we did that by working backwards. We didn't start by assuming 16 volts at the input. We assumed 1 volt at the output and then worked backwards using all these steps here to get the input. What this implies is that our parameter A is 1 over 16, or Vx is 1 16 times Vn. In reality, what is Vn in this problem? Vn is 64 volts. So our true output is 1 16th times 64 volts, or 4 volts. The idea here is rather than using nodal analysis, rather than using mesh analysis, rather than collapsing the circuit and using subsequent voltage division steps, instead we're using this linearity concept. We're assuming a value of the output. We're working backwards to see what the input would have to be to give us that output that's right there. We use that to find our A, and finally we plug that back into the original equation to find the true output.
And if you compare this example to the example that we did right after we introduced voltage division with the same circuit, you see that the answer is the same. It's 4 volts, but we found it using a very, very different method. Another good use of linearity is in system identification. And this is a very useful use of linearity in, let's say, an experimental setting, even if you don't have a circuit schematic. The idea here is you want to find your system parameters, your A and B coefficients, but you can do that by taking a whole bunch of measurements to find those A1, A2, B1, B2, etc. values. Turns out that the number of measurements you have to take has to equal the number of system parameters. And remember the number of system parameters is in turn equal to the number of independent inputs. So for example, suppose we have a circuit here and we don't know what's inside that circuit. It's a black box, but we do know that there are two inputs, VS1 and IS1. By taking two different measurements, in other words, you set VS1 equal to a value, set IS1 equal to a value, measure V out, then you change VS1, you change IS1 and measure V out again, you get two equations and two unknowns and you can solve for your A and B. V out is equal to A times VS1 plus B times IS1. The two unknowns are A and B. So if you have two sets of equations and two unknowns, you can solve for A and B. Let's illustrate that with an example. So here we have an unknown circuit, but we know that there are two inputs. There's an independent voltage source called VS1 and an independent current source called IS1. What we're going to do is determine the A and B parameters for the system using these two measurements here, measurement one and measurement two. Once we determine the A and B coefficients, we can then find the output if Vs was 10 volts and Is was negative 80 milliamps. So the idea here is we know that V out is going to be some constant A1 times Vs1 plus some constant B1 times Is1. And we're going to start by solving for our A1 and B1. How do we do that? For the measurement one, we know that the output 2.5 volts is going to be A1 times 20 volts plus B1 times 100 milliamps. From our second measurement, we know that the output is going to be 14 volts and it's going to be A1 times minus 20 volts plus B1 times 0.12 amps. So once again, from our inputs, Vs1 and Is1, we get the first equation, and from the second ones, we get the second equation. So now we have two equations and two unknowns, and notice I purposely picked the Vs1 so that if I add these two equations together, the A1s will cancel. So adding these equations together, 2.5 plus 14 is 16.5, equals A1 times 20 plus A1 times minus 20 is conveniently zero, and then B1 times 0.1 plus B1 times 0.12 is 0.22 times B1. The only unknown is B1. We can solve for it. We get that B1 is equal to 16.5 divided by 0.22 or 75. We can then solve for A1 by plugging this value of B1 back into that equation. So we get what? We get 2.5 is equal to a1 times 20 plus B1, which is 75, times 0.1. Solving for A1 then, you get 20 times A1 is equal to 2.5 minus 7.5, or A1 is equal to minus 520, or negative 1 fourth. So we get the final relationship that V out is equal to minus 1 fourth times Vs1 plus 75 times Is1. This is the first part of the problem. We found the general expression, and we did that from two sets of measurements, one here and one here. We can now do the second part of the problem. It said find the value of V out for a specific value of Vs1 and Is1. So V out is going to be minus 1 fourth times 10 volts plus 75 times 80 milliamps. You work out this math, you get minus 8.5 volts. And that's the answer to the second part of the problem. So in this example, I conveniently chose Vs1 and the two measurements to cancel each other out so that I only had to add these two equations together to solve for them. 
I could have used any two measurements for VS1 and IS1 to get the output. There's actually one measurement that even makes more sense than something like this. What if in the first measurement I said VS1 equal to 1 volt and IS1 0 amps and then in measurement 2 I chose a voltage of 0 volts and a current of 1 amp. So these two measurements here, 1 volt and 0 amp, followed by 0 volts and 1 amp, would allow us to get A1 and B1 directly. From this first thing, we would get A1 directly. From the second measurement, we would get B1 directly. This idea is superposition, which is what we're going to discuss next. So what is superposition? What we saw from before is that the linearity property of a circuit implies that any voltage or current in the circuit can be written as a weighted sum of the independent inputs. So the output is going to be a weighted sum of VS1, VS2, all the way up to VSN, and then IS1, IS2, all the way up to ISN. You could think of it as follows. This first term you could think of as a contribution due to VS1 only. Likewise, this is the contribution due to VS2 only, etc., etc., down the line. So what you could do, if you have a circuit with multiple inputs, and remember the inputs are our independent voltage and current sources, any voltage or current in the circuit is equivalent to the sum of the voltages due to each independent source acting alone, where you kill or turn off or deactivate the other independent sources. This is a principle of superposition. So what we're saying is rather than solving one complicated circuit with multiple inputs, we turn off all the inputs but one, measure the output, and then we pick another input, turn it on, turn off all the other inputs, measure the output, and we do that throughout and add all of the outputs together to get the final result. So here's the algorithm for superposition. The first thing you want to do is deactivate all but one independent source. And once again, the key word here is independent source. If you have dependent sources, they're not considered inputs, you do not deactivate them. So what does it mean to deactivate a source? If it's a voltage source, you set it equal to zero, which means you replace it by a short circuit. If it's a current source, you set it equal to zero, which means you replace it by an open circuit. So once you deactivate all but one independent sources, you then analyze that simplified circuit, and the circuit is certainly going to be simplified because it only has one source rather than two, three, or four, or whatever sources, you analyze the network using whatever techniques you want to get a partial output. And that gives you the output in terms of only that single independent source. Then you go back to step one and you activate a different source. So you turn off the source that was just on and you turn on a different source instead and you repeat the process. You keep going through this algorithm for every single independent source until you find the output due to each source. And then for a final step, you combine the results. And this is the superposition algorithm. So we'll finish today's lecture with a very simple example. This is an example we saw before. We use the linearity principle here to find expressions for VB and IA in terms of both VS1 and IS1. We're going to do it again now using the superposition principle. So first, we're going to activate IS1 only. So our simplified circuit is what? We have our input current IS1. We have a 120 ohm resistor. We have a 60 ohm resistor. The voltage source is killed, so it's set equal to a short circuit. We want to measure our two outputs. We're going to call them IA, and I'm going to call them IA sub 1 because it's not the true output IA, it's a partial output. And then we're going to call this voltage VB sub 1. But by getting rid of the voltage source, we now have a much easier way to solve for IA and VB. For example, IA we can get from current division. We have a single current source going into two parallel resistors, a 120 ohm resistor and a 60 ohm resistor. So from current division, we can easily get that IA1 is equal to the opposite resistance over the sum of the two resistances times the current source, or two thirds times IS1. How about VB1? Well, we can use current division and Ohm's law for that. So VB1 is the resistance 
times the current through the 120 ohm resistor. The current through that resistor is the opposite resistance over the sum of the two resistances times the total current. We get 40 times IS1. We set this aside, and now we activate VS1 only. So in this case, the current source is zero, which remember for a current source, zero would be an open circuit. So we open circuit the current source. We still have our 120 ohm resistor. We still have our 60 ohm resistor. But now our voltage source is present. Now we're going to measure IA sub 2 and VB sub 2. Once again, because this circuit is simpler than the original circuit, we might find that there are easier techniques to use. In fact, in this case, we could use voltage division because the 120 ohm resistor and the 60 ohm resistor are in series because there's no current flowing through that left branch because that current source is set equal to zero. So from voltage division, we get the VB2, this resistance, over the sum of those resistances times this current source. So VB2 is 120 over 120 plus 60 times VS1, which is equal to 2 thirds times Vs1. And we can get Ia2 from Ohm's law. So from Ohm's law, negative Ia2 because of the direction is Vs1 over 120 plus 60. So that means that Ia sub 2 is minus Vs1 over 180. Finally, we put these together. We see that Vb total is equal to Vb1 plus Vb2. So it's 2 thirds times Vs1 plus 40 times IS1. That's our first equation. And then we see that IA total is nothing more than the sum of this term and that term. So IA total is negative VS1 over 180 plus 2 thirds times IS1. If you compare these answers to what we got when we looked at the circuit in linearity, you see that the equations are the same. The difference is here we took our single circuit and broke it down into two simpler circuits. By breaking it down into simpler circuits, we could use things like current division and voltage division. And we could do this for a circuit of any complexity. We could have five different sources, 10 different sources, 15 different sources, it doesn't matter. You turn off all the sources but one, you find the output due to that one, you set it aside, and you repeat, taking each source just one at a time. Now, you may ask yourself whether it's easier or harder to do multiple simpler circuits rather than one more complicated circuit. It might depend upon the situation. But regardless of whether it's easier or more difficult, one of the advantages of superposition is it lets us see the direct relationship between a particular source and a measurement, how that measurement is affected by that particular source. So even if the analysis is not easier using superposition, sometimes breaking it down and thinking of the circuit that way makes a lot of sense. We will pick this lecture up next time with another example of superposition using some dependent sources, and then we'll segue into learning about Thevenin's and Norton's theorem. Have a good day.